Here we are at the last session of the GCC BOSC. Um, I know we still have BOFs and we have a dinner and we have a core fest tomorrow, but today what we're going to have is we're going to have a keynote speaker uh, and then we're going to have some closing remarks. So uh, starting with the first item, um, we are very lucky to have uh, Dr. Lucia Piacetto to present the closing keynote of uh, GCC BOSC. Uh, she'll be discussing about the effect of confounding factors on data variability and methods that her laboratory is working on and the methods that, that they're using to uh, account for these factors. Uh, one of the things that she mentioned, which was quite interesting, is uh, her lab is 100% 50-50, and uh, I think you'll have to wait for her talk to understand what that means. Um, uh, Dr. Piesciotto is, uh, she's currently an assistant professor at the Elson Floyd College of Medicine at the Washington State University. Uh, she received her bachelor's degree in biochemistry from University of uh, Republic from Uruguay in 2002 and received her PhD in 2009 from University of Pennsylvania. In 2015, she completed her postdoctoral training and took her current position at the Washington State University. Her research focuses on using genomic and computational biology, uh, biology approaches to study brain function, in particular understanding the underlying molecular mechanism of autism spectrum disorder. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Piacciotto to present this keynote address. Everybody hear me? Yes? Good. Uh, I want to thank the organizers for inviting me. Uh, I want to thank Pratik, Dave, and Nicole. They've been answering my questions constantly. I also want to commend the conference for being so family friendly. If that wasn't so, I wouldn't be here. I always like to start my talks by telling a little bit about what my lab does because I have suffered from a confused identity in meetings for a really long time. I did my PhD in genomics and computational biology, and then I did my postdoc in neuroscience. So when I go to neuroscience conferences, people know me as the neuroscientist that does data. And when I go to computational biology conferences, they know me as the computational biology that does brain. And the truth is that what we do is we try to answer neuroscience questions using computational biology approaches. We study autism spectrum disorders, and you may or may not know that is the most prevalent neurodevelopmental disorder. In the United States, one in every 64 children today will be born in the spectrum, one in 24 boys. But the spectrum is really wide. There's really impaired individuals that can barely talk. There's really high functioning individuals that are savants with an incredibly high IQ. So what we try to understand is what underlies severity, and we study two brain processes that are important for development to do so, learning and sleep. Because as it turns out, learning badly and sleeping badly are very good predictors of severity. So we combine you know, traditional wet lab neuroscience things. We generate a lot of functional genomic data, mostly in mouse. We analyze human genome sequencing data. This is mostly through consortia. I also not averse to actually using any public data that I can find as long as you know I can get my hands on it. But we also do reproducible bioinformatics because I obviously care that my results are reproducible. But this started with a very interesting conundrum that I faced when I started my postdoc. I started my postdoc as the only person that did data analysis. And the first thing that I was asked is, can you fix some data I have? I think a lot of you may identify with this request. And then, you know, I was young and I didn't want to say no. But, and so I asked, what do you mean by fix the data? And it turned out that what we were really talking about was that the data was not reproducible. In that day, that was my foray data, there was a graduate student that spent hours doing hundreds of qPCRs in hundreds, it's not even close to explaining how much work this kid was doing, and the data was not matching well. Only about 40% of the genes that were testing were replicating. So I went in, I wrote five lines of code, and the rate went from 40% to 99. 
And then everybody wanted me to do magic on the data. But it's not magic, right? So that's what I'm going to talk to you about. So let's go back to something very simple, which is experimental design. So in biology, we do experiments. We try to design our experiments well. There's always things that we do not care about that influence the measurement. And I'm going to call those confounders. I will say that all data is confounded. More or less confounded, but most data is confounded. When we design our experiment, we include something called controls. And the ob ob objective of those controls is to estimate the effect of the treatment that we care versus the effect of the confounders. Those are called positive and negative controls. When you have very complex data sets, sometimes or often the confounders are known or they are very hard to control for, or the confounders can dominate the signal that you're interested in measurement. So I will argue that omics data sets are complex because they measure thousands of events simultaneously, and there's a variety of technical and biological factors that can affect the measurements. So when I look at the data when I started my postdoc, the problem wasn't really that the data was confounded. The problem is what I call push button by informatics, right? They had gotten this data, they have gotten to the core, somebody pushed a button and then did this, right? And that was the problem, right? And so I spent almost the rest of my career trying to make the point that how you analyze the data matters. And I realized at that moment, after magically fixing that data set, that it doesn't matter how many logical reasons you have about why the data analysis has to be careful. You have to show that it makes a difference, and then people pay attention. Okay, so in my talk, I'm going to basically go over the story of what happened since that day I've magically fixed that data. I'm going to talk first about transcriptomic data for the most part, and then about epigenomic data. And I'm going to basically show you case studies. And this is all my data, because I have done this for other people's data, but I don't like to criticize other people's data. So I'm going to just show you that my data is really messy. right? So it's, it's just better to be positive and not criticize other people. So you're going to be seeing some data collected while doing some very interesting things that the brain does, like learn or not sleep. So I think both all of you can probably identify with those two things. And how you can actually see what the difference it makes when you analyze the data correctly and the kind of insight you get and when you don't. So the part one, we're going to talk about transcriptomic studies. The, a while ago, we had a technology called microarrays. And you know that you're really old when you tell an undergrad about a microarray and they react the same way that my two and a half year old daughter reacts when she sees a phone that is not a flat rectangle right? and she's really confused. But we had those things called micro microarrays and everybody knew that confounders were a problem. The question was how much of a problem. Then we switched technologies into RNA-seq. But the problem didn't really go away because we changed the technology, right? And, and this kind of problem is present whenever we want to test differences. It doesn't matter what is a microarray or an AC or chip seek or a tax seek, right? So I'm gonna, I always like to give spoilers in my talks in case you fall asleep like half through it. I sometimes do it. You know, we're tired, it's the end of the conference. So we're gonna see that most commonly used data analysis pipelines for RNA seq don't remove any confounders other than library size. And then I'm gonna show you uh, the results about one particular method. RUV, which is relatively new and is not the only good one that actually does. And, I also, and I'm going to show you that the choice of the data analysis method can completely change the biological conclusion of the study. And I'm going to go through detail through the first example, and I'm going to show you some other data just to make the point that it's not really just one experiment that actually has that problem. So how do we remove the effect of confounders in data analysis? So I already said the things that we do not care about can vary between different experiments. So confounders are very unavoidable. There's a huge list of things that can be confounders. Library size, different time, different day, different operators, equipment, cellular heterogeneity. I mean, there's a lot of them. Also, sometimes we wish to combine data that has been generated in two very different places. 
right? And that is even more challenging because there's a lot more confounders, but we would like to compare all that data, especially if we want to harbor all that publicly available data that is out there. So normalization is the step in the data analysis that corrects for the effects of confounders. There's no pipeline for analysis that does not do a normalization step. What happens if normalization doesn't work? There's two things that can happen. You can find genes that are differentially expressed but are not due to treatment. Those are called false positives. Or you may have limited power to detect the differential expression, and those are called false negatives. So if you don't normalize your data correctly, you reduce or eliminate the power and reproducibility of your study. Now, just having a step in your pipeline that says normalization doesn't mean that your our normalization actually works. You have to tell, tell that your step really actually removed the confounders. So I'm going to briefly go over different ways that you can use to actually tell if you remove the confounders. The first one, which is an obvious one, but I cannot tell you how many times I had conversations about why this matters, but I think here I'm preaching to the choir. Your replicates need to be more similar to each other than they are to samples from other conditions. And you can use something like a PCA to show that. You have to show that your samples have comparable overall mean and variance. And when you're doing statistical testing, the p-value distributions have to be mostly uniform. And I'm going to get back to that in, in a little bit. And also, hopefully, you know what your experiment is about, so you have positive and negative controls, right? Maybe, maybe not. So this is a very egregious example of a retracted paper of what we are talking about when your PCA plots can reveal your confounders, right? What you have here is a principal component analysis. And this experiment is looking at differential expression using microarrays between lung cancer and control samples. They are color coded in black and green. And then in this particular case, somebody had somewhat brilliant idea of collecting the samples in two very different time points separated by about three months. And, you know, they looked at what they really wanted to know is what are the genes that are differentially expressed between the cancer and the controls, but what they actually got is what genes are differentially expressed between two months apart, right? This is called batch effects. This is a very known source contribution of confounding factors. It doesn't always look as bad, but this is obviously a problem. This means you are not really measuring what you want to measure. Early plots is a way to see if your samples are on the same scale. After you normalize, if each of these boxes is a sample, they should all have the same mean and variance, right? They should be in the same scale. You're comparing apples to apples and not apples to oranges. Often, you don't see this. So then you're comparing elements in completely different scales, and that is not something that will work very well. The histograms of p-values. And this is something that I actually have to say. Not a lot of people are aware of. Probably all of you are. But sometimes when you, I give a lot of biology talks, people look at me and say, I'm not sure what we're talking about. So when you're doing statistical testing, you often tell thousands of null hypotheses that are something like this. The mean expression of gene under condition one is the same as the mean expression of gene under condition two. Your alternate hypothesis is that that's not true. When your null hypothesis is true, you should have an even distribution of p-values, and then an alternate hypothesis, they should look very small. So an expected distribution then looks like this. If this is a histogram, these are the p-values, and this is the frequency. You have a small proportion, very low p-values, and everything else is uniform. I, I see this a lot of times, this very sort of weird distribution of p-values, which is a sure indication that there's a confounding factor in your data. So uh, I started my, PhD, my, P, my postdoc in neuroscience, and I started looking at papers. And I started uh, looking for those PCA plots. And I never found them on the papers, and, and that made me a little bit bothered. So I went on to GEO, and I downloaded every data set I could find. This is all RNA-seq that had at least three replicates, and I had a second sort of filtering factor. It had to have been published in a double-digit impact factor journal, right? And this is actually just a selection of what I found to just show you what the examples are, right? 
And, and I put the GSC numbers on top because my postdoc advisor was concerned if I put so-and-so at all that I will offend too many people because this is actually published. And so, and I also selected different kinds of treatments that I know that people in neuroscience do. So here, we have a wild type and a knockout, and this is RNA-seq of uh, mRNA. Here we have a wild type and a knockout, and this is RNA-seq of microRNA. And what you can see here, even if you do not read the labels, the same colors are replicates of the same condition, right? And you do not see the proper grouping of replicates together. Neither you do here. This is a study of behavior. This is a learning form. And this is actually, I turned out to learn that this is very commonly what you get, this sort of mash of everything together. And then here I saw something that was a little bit more hopeful. You have your controls, and then you inject the brain with a drug that really kills half of your neurons. And now your treatment is the first principal component. And I did this with a lot of data sets, and I estimated about 80% of the data sets published in double-digit impact factors were confounded. Then, you know, but it's not very hopeful if you cannot do anything about it, right? So I'm going to show you a case of a study that I did. I really want to know what the effect of learning in gene expression was. This is our RNA-6 study of a region of your brain called the hippocampus. It's buried deep inside your brain and is the place in which all your memories start. And I knew a lot about this after reading for a couple of years and playing with mice for a couple of years. I had never touched a mouse in my life before. We know that long-term memory formation requires transcription. We know that because if we inhibit transcription, you do not remember, right? I had a lot of several, a lot of positive controls, genes, and pathways. I did a huge literature review and I assembled those data sets. We know that the transcriptional changes are likely to be similar among different forms of learning. However, the published studies, and at that time were only microarrays, show little to no agreement between each other, right? So I'm gonna show you the two little tasks that we made our mice learn. One is called fear conditioning. It's a very classical form of conditioning. I'm sure all of you have experienced this once. The idea is that if you actually experience something really, really frightful at the same time of something else, then you will remember that something else for a long time. So how do we do that? We put the mouse in a box. The box is new. The mice like to explore new environments. And after they've been happily exploring, we shock them on the paw. The whole floor is electrified. They jump and hit their head on the box. Then we send them to their, uh, their home, their colony, and they're consolidating. All these transcription changes that I told you are happening. And then the next day, we put them on the box, and the box is not shocking them. But they're so afraid to walk, they don't move. And we can quantify that, right? I, I like quantifiable things. So then we took time points here, and we took their hippocampus, and we prep our NACC libraries. The first one is FC30, fear conditioning 30, because we know that this 30 minutes after it happening is the window in which you inhibit transcription you don't remember. We have controls at the same time point. Time of day is a huge factor in gene expression in the brain. And then we also, at that exactly same time of day, but the next day, we took the samples. So from now on, I'm gonna drop the 30, and this is FC, RT, and CC. Then we did another form of learning. This one is not so scary, right? So it's a little bit hard to learn. It's called object location. And it works like this. The mouse comes into the box. There's two little cubes. They're new, they're fun, they explore them. If the mouse, the next day, we move one of the cubes. If the mouse remembers that, that where the cubes were the day before, it was gonna spend more time exploring the, the cube that was moved, right? And the mice actually like to explore shiny, hard things, right? Not fluffy things for some reason. <laughs> and we took hippocampus again of the exactly the same time point, but in this case it's OLM and the same types of controls. So first I'm gonna talk about what our data is. We have five biological replicates of each condition and we have two different experiments done by two different people in two different labs, right? And we wanted to ask several questions, just like how, what are the genes that are differentially expressed in fear condition, in OLM. And then because this, this HC and this CC mice over here are supposedly exactly the same object. They are mice that are just hanging out at the same time of day. 
we are supposing that they are the same and we're going to be using them to basically take away the differences between labs and, and manipulators. And we also wanted to know what are the differences in gene expression that are common between the two different tasks. In addition of doing this, um, uh, one thing I didn't tell you is I did a microarray before. So we have a completely independent genome-wide experiment that we can use as external validation. And then we have this uh, pretty large amount of negative and positive controls from the curated literature. And all those hundreds of qPCRs this graduate student was, was doing that I told you about at the beginning, right? So we have a lot of controls. So then we're going to take a look at standard pipelines for normalization. You may or may not be familiar with them. Upper quantile, TMM, and FPKM are very commonly used methods to normalize RNA-seq data. They only correct for library size. And then we're going to use RUV-seq, which is a method that can theoretically correct for any and all confounders present if you give them enough information. So this method was not developed by me. Actually, when I collected that data, I knew I needed something, and it wasn't there available. And through uh, an official mentor of mine, I met Davide Rizzo, who then was also a postdoc. I went to Berkeley, where he was, and I spent three or four months working with him. And this was before this paper got published. But uh, if you want to really know more details about the method, it was published in Nature Biotechnology in 2014. And this is, in a nutshell, how it works. Usually, we model differential expression using linear models that looks something like this. You have an observed expression that is, is the product of the effect of the treatment and some sort of error. The RUV-seq model just adds one term to this, which is a matrix, which is the effect of K confounding factors. We need to estimate the effect of K confounding factors. We use that. We use PCA to, to do so. We use PCA to detect the number of K confounders to remove. Now, this particular step is extremely important and time consuming. You cannot detect the number of K automatically. You have to look at the PCA and the RLE, and you have to remove one K at a time, and you have to have controls of some sort to estimate this. RUV Seq has different flavors. It can use either control genes or control samples to estimate this. And what are control samples? They are biological replicates. So if you have biological replicas that you can consider identical, and that sometimes is not the case with cancer samples, for example, but in this case it is, then you can use the differences between them to build this K-matrix, right? A key important factor is that we do not directly normalize the expression matrix at all. The confounders are removed by modeling them as a term in the linear equation, okay? So what I'm showing you here is the data of the fear conditioning experiment, FC, HRT, and CC. They are all color-coded differently. And, and they are really plots. And what you have here is raw counts. And then you have TMM and FPKM normalization. And you can see that their PCA plot of these two normalization methods is no different than using raw data. Right? This was actually pretty surprising and pretty sad. From now on, I'm going to be comparing the RUV results mostly for upper quantile, which is the one that we thought gave better results. Here again, you have the comparison of upper quantile normalization and the PCA plots. And now you have RUVS. And S stands for samples. If you're lucky to have a lot of negative control genes, you can use RUVG. And now you can see how pretty this PCA plot looks like, right? Now we're going to look at differential expression between FC and CC samples, which was one of the questions. And here again, these are histogram of p-values. And you can see how you improve the uniformity. And these are typical volcano plots of log 2 versus log p-value. And where we have color-coded here are red, the positive controls. Are you guys seeing this? There you go. Of the literature. Green, the netted controls from the independent microarray study. And in blue, the FDR then this case is less than 0 0.1. And what you can see is that you increase the power considerably of your differential detection. And more importantly, you increase the detection of positive controls. 
Now we are comparing the results of RNA-seq normalized with RUV with the results of microarray data. And I often hear when I go around, people tell me that microarray and RNA-seq give you very different results. But they are supposedly measuring the same thing, right? So that shouldn't be the case, right? So in this case, they were given very different results. But if you actually compare here the concordance between microarray and RNA-seq, and what we have here is the percent concordance, and this is the rank of the genes from, more, from high to low, you can see that without really applying RUV to the microarray data, you actually increase the concordance between data sets by just changing the normalization data. So it is absolutely not true that microarray and RNA-seq data do not agree. It really depends on how many confounders you are and whether you're really scaling them properly. They should agree pretty highly, even though not 100%. Now, we wanted to combine the two different types of learning data sets that were taken by completely different people into different labs. And this is what we have here. We have OLM and HC, and we have FC and CC. And here we have our per quantile. And obviously when you look at your principal component analysis, what you get is the lab, right? But when you do RUVS, and now what we are doing is we are assuming that the mice that are sitting in their cages are the same age, they are the same biological entity. We're using that to estimate our unwanted factors. Now you can get a much better scaling on the RLE plots, and then you get a much more proper grouping on your PCA plot. Now in the end, what I get is, okay, this looks pretty computationally, does it make a difference in the results that you get? And this is just one of the results of the paper. You can remove the enrichment for pathways that you know are wrong, right? So what we, hear, what we have here is just functional enrichment analysis. This was done with go terms and keg pathways. And when you did upper quantum normalization, what you got was enrichment of basically housekeeping processes, ribosome and glycolysis, and we knew that that was not true. While you RUV normalize, you do not see that at all, okay? So that was our first example where our first data set. You went from discovering things very little in the case of the fear conditioning to discovering a lot. When you're combining data sets, you were from not being able to integrate two things from different labs to actually put them together in the same scale and ask coherent questions. Now I'm gonna show you another data set. In this case, this data set looks at the effects of sleep deprivation and subsequent recovered sleep in the cortex. The cortex is the top of your brain, higher function processing. We study what sleep deprivation does a lot too. So what we know about the system, we know that sleep deprivation causes substantial changes in gene expression in the brain. Sleep deprivation actually has a very strong effect size. Multiple studies were published, and in this case, this is all microarray data, and have been done genome-wide, and again, they didn't agree at all, right? So how is that possible? We also have positive controls, because a lot of people have done a lot of qPCRs over the last 20 years, so we've put those together. And the last thing that is really important is that it takes at least three hours of sleep to discharge the increase in sleep pressure caused by sleep deprivation. For all of you, if you want to take a nap and recover from something, you know, three hours, and then things start looking a little bit more normal. This means that until three hours, we shouldn't really see things being the same anymore. So we know this is true. So how do we do this experiment? This is our timeline. You have five to six hours of sleep deprivation. And then we are sampling one hour after that, two hours or three hours. The important part to um, think about this is that we use a very advanced technological thing called a paintbrush to keep the <laughs> mice awake. So it's, it's very time intensive. And you, but then we cannot make uh, any animal fall asleep. We can just allow them to do so, right? So there's a huge variability on how much they're actually sleeping here. Again, because time of day is very, very important in gene expression, you need to have matched time of day controls. And one of the things that we discovered that was really nice is that RUV-seq actually will take in any log transform microarray data, which means that you can actually integrate RNA-seq and microarray data 
together, right? In this case, this is all microarray data, but we have used it to actually compare microarray and RNA-seq data together. So the first thing that we wanted to do is we just wanted to look at the sleep deprivation data sets. So they're the ones that were taken here, but the ones that were published and didn't agree, right? Together with ours, which had two different ones. In this case, the standard normalization method for microarray data is RMA. And what you see here in uh, orange is the control samples and in green is the sleep deprived samples. And obviously when you RMA normalize, and this actually were four studies, they all have different shapes. You couldn't really take away the difference between platform. These were also done in different microarray platforms or labs, right? And then again, we have our positive controls, and you couldn't capture any of them, right? But then we did RUV, and in this case, it's also RUVS. And now you start seeing separation. It's never perfect, right? Between controls and sleep deprived, your p value distribution looks good, and you capture back 94% of the positive controls. And these were experiments that were done over a span of 15 years, right? You can put them together, right? Then we did our own uh, microarray study of the effects of recovery sleep, and I'm just going to show briefly some of the results. This is also published. You're welcome to, in an open access journal, of course, and you're welcome to look at it. And what we have here is the number of uh, differentially expressed genes that are up or down in each of the conditions, the sleep deprivation, one hour of being allowed to sleep, two, three, and six, right? And what you can see is that uh, using R RMA, which is in light gray, or RUV, with sleep deprivation, doesn't really change very much the number of differentially expressed genes. And why? Because the effect of the confounders is also on your treatment, depends on the effect size of your treatment. And as I told you, sleep deprivation is a really strong, <laughs> has a really strong effect on your brain. I'm pretty sure you're aware of that. However, when you start looking at the effect of recovery sleep, if you didn't have RUV, you will think that everything got back to normal within an hour. And we know that is not true, right? So what this is showing you is when you have an experiment in which you have different treatments with different effect sizes, you can actually be misguided when you have confounders that are sort of inserted in the middle between your different effect sizes, right? And, and so then after that, we had a, a really sort of nice distribution of decay over the hours, and we got some really nice findings about the molecular basis of what we call recovery sleep. I'm going to show a last study, and this is unpublished, right? And this is something that we're doing right now, and it's the effects of sleep deprivation in a mouse model of autism, right? And what we know is that the mutant mice behave very differently than the wild type, and specifically, they respond differently to sleep deprivation, right? So again, PCA plots, one more time, I love them, I use them a lot. What you see here is either using FPKM normalization or TMM, and what you have in blue is the wild type, and in red is the knockout, right? So with FPKM, you don't see any separation between samples. When you use TMM, you see the effect of sleep deprivation, which is a strong effect, but if you use this, you will conclude that there's no difference between mutants and wild types, right? Well, if you use RUV, you see that your first principal component is your sleep deprivation effect, and the second principal component is your genotype, right? Which we actually know has to be that way. So to conclude the first part of my talk, RUV seems to deal with confounders that are left untouched by other methods. We know this because it gives you better results. In the end, you have to show that it gives better results before people can believe you that data analysis makes a difference. You don't need to know what the confounders are to be able to deal with them but you do need to do biological replicates and ideally have controls, but I don't think this is anything very surprising, right? RUV is not the only method that is useful to use this. You can use SVA. Actually, we try all the batch effect methods around it and SVA is the only one that will actually handle this. Uh, but you, don't, you cannot let it estimate the K or the confounders from the data, right? The other thing that we saw is that RUV-seq is a bioconductor package with a vignette and is widely available, but it was still not being used because a lot of the people analyzing data couldn't really understand a vignette. So we designed a tutorial that came with the paper, which was basically a walkthrough step-by-step -step to generate all the figures in the paper, right? And this is something that we have carried over 
And when people are in power and seeing the results, it was really easy to substitute their data from mine in the tutorial, right? We have moved on to now do our markdowns with it, but at that time it was a tutorial. It was actually three years ago. Now we're gonna move to epigenomics, and um, I finished all of this and I thought I knew what I was doing. It's just a different kind of data, right? But we got it, no, we don't, right? So uh, just a really quick review of what happens in the nucleus. DNA, of course, doesn't fit in a nucleus, all stretched out. So it gets packed up in different levels. This is DNA, it first gets wrapped up around these little balls called histones, and then it gets pulled up even further and eventually into chromosomes, right? And at all these different levels of packings, there are layers of regulation that allow you to access the DNA. So in order to access the DNA, you have to unpack things, and in order to express genes, you need to access the DNA. So all of these different kinds of uh, biochemical modifications allow you to regulate this packing. The first one is DNA methylation. It happens directly on the DNA. The other one is controlling how the nucleosomes are positioned, and that can be done just by their physical positioning or by modifying the nucleosome with something called histone modifications. And the technology to measure that is called ChIP-seq, if you are not familiar. Familiar, and all of these things in combination produce change in changes in chromatin accessibility. And it's important to uh, remember this hierarchy because chromatin accessibility is the biological end result of, of all of these things. So, you know, collectively you can get all these types of data sets MediaSeq, ChIPSeq, SonoSeq, ATACSeq, FairSeq. You know, this is the kind of things that you do if you want to look at epigenomic data. Now, epigenomic data is a little bit different than gene expression data, and the main difference is that you do not really know a priori where your signal is going to be, right? In your RNA-seq data, the signal is usually in the genes, while in your epigenomic data, the signal is where things are open or things are used, and you have to find that out first. So the analytical step to do that is called peak calling, right? And one of the things that I actually realized that it was a known fact in computational biology meetings, but unpublished and apparently unknown in biology meetings, is that the peaks show very little reproducibility across replicates, right? So what I'm gonna show you again, spoiler alert before I start, is that the peak reproducibility is indeed low and therefore is the first source of confounders that you need to address when working at this data. To address this issue, you need replicates. And again, when working at transcriptomics, I was never faced with a lot of resistance when I said, you know, you need to do replicates. But the ENCODE standards of replicates is two. So I know I actually, or was, it's not anymore? Oh, well, it shouldn't be. Well, that's exactly my point. But there is a publication that says two. And so a lot of the times when thinking about costs, they say, well, if this paper says two, we're gonna do two. And that makes, that's a really big problem for data analysis. So uh, I made it my mission to show why you need replicas, even though I'm probably preaching to the choir over here. And then after you do that, you still have all these problems I already told you about with the RNA-seq data, right? So you need to use RUV, but it's a little bit different. So we, in short, we developed this approach called the scan that, is, that addresses reproducibility in epigenomic data. And I'm gonna show you right now, when you use it, you change the biological conclusions, okay? So this, so again, I went back to public data to make the point that something was wrong, the same way I did with the geo data sets and the PCA plots, right? So here is ENCO3, chromatin accessibility data that was released this February. This, this is all the brain data that I could fit in a slide. And what we have here is the number of replicates and here we have the number of peaks that were called. And I didn't do anything but grab their peak calls from the ENCODE side. But what we're graphing here is for a given sample, how many peaks you find individually in each replicate, how many peaks agree if you have two replicates, and agree means an overlap of one base, just one base, and three. And because the standard is two, a lot of the replicates only have two, but I think it's easy to see that this is really a big drop in the number of peaks that actually reproduce. This is my own data. These are mice. They are hanging out. They are doing nothing. They're just hanging out. This is Easton H3K9 acetyl. 
This is ChIP-seq. So these are the controls from an experiment. This is hippocampus, and it's exactly the same plot, right? And you can see is there's a very sharp peak, but around three to four, it starts sort of flattening out, which is, you know, you will expect you three, four replicas, things start getting better. But in the end, I had to generate these plots to address a reviewer that told me that, you know, this didn't happen, actually. So this actually was all response to reviews. So I'm going to show you now a study on how learning impacts chromatin accessibility. And it's exactly the same study that we did for the RNAC. The samples were, in fact, collected at the same time, right? We did something called SonoSeq. It's a 2000 PNAS paper, right? So I didn't make it up. I also get asked that question. And it's exactly the same tissue. And this is actually was published not that long as a cover of Science Signal. What do we know? We know that epigenetic regulation is necessary for long-term memory formation, the same way we know transcription. These are pharmacological studies. I'm going to show you that learning has an overall ef large effect in chromatin accessibility. But when you use standard pipelines, you find no individual location significantly different, right? So what was happening? So let's go over uh, the experiment for a little bit. Um, it's exactly the same cage, shock your paw thing that I told you about earlier. But instead of collecting RNA-seq at this 30-minute window that we know matters, we basically cross-linked the cells, we isolated the nucleus, and then we sonicate it and reverse the cross-link. So you're, you're basically selecting for the regions that are very easy to break physically. So what we have here is a plot is an aggregate over all transcriptional start size. We expect this data to be biased towards promoters, right? Promoters tend to be accessible. And here is just the recount per million map reads. What we have in green is the average of four biological replicates in home cage conditions. And in orange, we have the average of four biological replicates after fear conditioning. So you see overall transcription start size, you have a pretty large effect. And then we saw the same problem with the peak location that I showed you before. So here we have the replicates and the number of peaks. We call them regions in this case. And this is just our SonoSeq data. And this is overall the, all the eight replicates. And again, you have this problem. So we decided to design the scan. And the scan is actually a very, very simple concept tool, right? So you feed it uh, sequencing reads that are aligned to your genome after quality filtering. And it basically does a peak calling stage first. And it, there's two differences between the peak calling and the scan and what common other tools usually do. The first one is that it doesn't require an input, right? If you guys work with this, you probably know what an input is. I also can tell you that SonoSeq and input are exactly the same thing. So we can have an input of an input. So we couldn't do that. And the idea is that it takes each individual replicate and it uses the overall 5 KB of background to computation uh, surrounding the region to computationally simulate a background. It calls peaks. And then what it does is aligns the peaks over all the replicates. So our pipeline requires at least three replicates. And then it selects regions with peaks with multiple replicates. After that, you build a matrix very similar to a gene expression matrix. and it ca in and I will show you that you really need to use RUV to normalize or you will find nothing, right? So here is our normalization. Again, we have our upper quantum normalization. We have our PCA plots. We have our histograms and our little volcano plots. And when you do RUV, and in this case, it's always S based on samples. We don't have any controls. This makes me very nervous. I usually don't do this. But you can see that now you have a very good separation between the fear conditioning and the controls. And all of a sudden, at a, and this is an FDR of 0 0.05, you have about 2,000 differentially regulated regions, right? When we already knew that we have a huge effect of learning. But because we don't have controls, we were faced with the question, are these real, right? So how we'll go around trying to figure out whether they're real. So my student, John, then said, well, we have to figure out if they are non-random. Are they associated with particular processes, right? And what we've shown is that learning regulated regions are actually the same that are active during development. And because we had RNA-seq data that I showed before, we also showed that they are associated with splicing, right? 
So what we have here, and we try every single ENCODE data set we could find, so I'm only showing you the relevant ones, is we were looking at enrichment. So what in a set of 2,300 or so regions collected randomly from the genome, and we did this randomly from the genome and randomly from all our Sonosic data too, what is the expected distribution of the overlap between that and, in this case, these are histone methylation and acetylation marks. This is active chromatin. Then this is repressed chromatin, right? And what you have in your violin plots are all the expected distribution of overlaps. And what you have in these dots are the observed distribution of overlaps, right? So you don't need necessarily need me to tell you what these three dots mean in terms of the p-value to see that the enrichment is extremely high. And what is interesting about it is that the enrichment is always higher when you look at developmental stage data sets than it is when with adults, okay? The other thing that we look is at a taxi chromatin accessibility data. And again, there's almost a perfect overlap. If you see this number, you maybe don't. This is 2,000. We're talking about an almost perfect overlap between the, regular, the, the regions that learning opens and the regions that are known to be open at a very specific stage of development, right? So all, meaning that all the, 20, the 2,000 regions are open by learning, are open by a taxi during day 14 of embryonic development in mouse. And you see this enrichment to, uh, in developmental stages a little bit better here. These are three active histone marks, and what you see here is the three replicates of the embryonic day, and these are the three replicates of the day of birth. This is a time series that they have published, and then you can see that even though there is an enrichment, we always have a significant enrichment over the embryonic days. And this concept that learning recapitulates development in a way is a really, really old idea in neuroscience research, right? So we were providing support for something that has been thought about for a while. And what we have here finally is the overlap between our learning regulated regions and their association with genes that we know are differentially expressed at exactly that same time point. And this is the FC in light blue and dark blue, or the day you remember, the following day. And what you see here is a very moderate enrichment for uh, gene level events but a much higher enrichment for splicing events. Even though it's not as good as you, if you, uh, as you think, it should be based on the absolute number of differences. We also saw a lot of associations with other things. I'm not gonna go over all the biology results. The more important one is that these learning regulated regions are associated with known autism risk factors. And that's something that we pursued. I'll be happy to talk about it or you can go read the paper. But overall, I just want to conclude this part. So the scan integrates peak calling across replicas to produce reproducible peak locations. You need at least three biological replicas to use it. Replicates are important. I don't think anybody here will actually dis disagree with that. You still need RUV normalization because there's a lot of additional confounders besides peaks. And the more important thing from the biological point of view is you go from no discovery to showing that learning likely recapitulates development at the epigenetic level. From finding nothing to providing support to a very long standing idea in the neuroscience field, right? Now, DSCAN2 is now available in the latest release of Bioconductor. If any of you is going uh, to BioC at the end of July, it's gonna be presented there. If, if you wanna use it, check it out. I'm sure there's a lot of things are not perfect with it and we can get a lot of input. I want to sort of conclude with some final remarks that uh, confounders are not a problem that are limited to gene expression or epigenetic studies, right? It's a really pervasive pro problem. Proper sample collection is always necessary. Now, the fact that RUV can fix things doesn't mean that you can actually start with a really messy set of data. But what my data is showing is that it may not be enough. I started my postdoc thinking that all I was seeing was bad experimental design. And all I show you is my data, and trust me, I did everything possible to design it as the best I can, and you can still not control it. The, contri the contribution of your confounders is different in every experiment, 
So you need to know your system and know your controls or work with somebody does. And you need to tailor the analysis pipeline to the data. And as a bioinformatician, do not engage in push button bioinformatics. It leads to error producible science and it devalues your expertise. Right? So with that, I wanna thank a lot of people. Not that many, I have a very small group that started only three years ago. But I, I wanna acknowledge the people in my lab, Chris, Taylor, Hannah, Leandro, and John, who is now a PhD student at OHSU. He's here, he didn't get to wear white coats to take pictures. It was really funny because my, my computational postdoc had never put a coat on and they wanted us to pose like holding pipettes and so he was excited about holding a pipette. I wanna uh, thank Ted Abel, uh, he was my postdoctoral mentor. I uh, started this work in his lab. I wanna thank Terry Speed who has been a really strong influence throughout my career. David Eriso who was a postdoc and worked with me for a long time, we're very good friends. He's now a PI, Will Cornell. Dario Regali uh, took uh, our GitHub code of the scan, which is publicly available, made it BioC compatible, and made bio, bio the scan too, which now can be used by a wider community. I want to thank to my closer collaborator lab, uh, the lab of Marcus Frank, who does sleep and development and helps us with all the tickling of the mouse with paintbrushes. He's also my husband, by the way. I also want to thank a really broad community called New PI Slack. If you don't know what it is, it's an open community of young investigators that started as 50 people on Slack and now it's 800 people worldwide. We share a lot about, it, about each other. We share grants, we share feelings. I honestly cannot be here without them. New PI Slack also has given birth to future PI Slack and graduate student Slack, in case anybody's interested. And I want to acknowledge my funding because I need to pay for the experiments. So I'll be happy to take any questions.